non-local street-level entertainment discussion with your hosts, Corey Kamori and John Conway. Hey, Corey. Hello, John Conway. How's it going? Pretty good. Right on, right on. We're How are you, Chell? Chell is good. She is always good because she's a bean. She has very short legs. Yeah. So she is low to the ground, and she can kind of duck underneath all of life's problems. I hope the mic can pick up her uh, licking her lips. <laughs> I know if Spike were here, he could definitely pick that up. You can hear that across the... Well, Spike the is the leader of a kingdom, so Spike <laughs> needs to be heard from all corners of the kingdom, so... Yeah, I don't know about him licking his lips, though. No. Well, maybe one day Chell will be his um, duchess or something. He, she can help rule this... Um, this part of the realm. You're looking very royal now, so... Trying, <laughs> trying to butter me up or something. <laughs> it has been did, a minute since we've been doing this podcast thing here. Did Chell enter Spike's giveaway? I don't know if Chell did. I don't think we entered Chell in the Spike giveaway. Oh, they, they, I figured that that would make it so that we would have... You know, there would be some, like, bias there. You know, you, got, you just would be like, you know... Nah, I'm the only one that can't enter. Oh, you're the... <laughs> You're the Chell's only like, one that... I was like, yeah, Dad. It's like, yeah, hey, we need to get me some new stuff, Dad. Oh, man. Yeah, man, it has been a while. Yeah, I think, honestly, last I checked, it's been about a year, maybe it's been almost, over a year. It was like two years almost, I think. Because we did it... It's been almost, a long-ass time. Almost... I think it's almost been two years. I'm wondering if I we was... should even keep this, <laughs> the whole don't hassle me on local thing. Uh, I don't know. I feel That's like Bill name. Murray. I feel like Bill Murray would be proud and, and, and it's versatile enough that we could talk about anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? like I was thinking about that too when I was like, you know, we need to get back on this uh, just to just to like talk about anything, you know, about what we like. And I was thinking about the name, and I was like, you know what? That's like one of those cool things that you know it might still make sense if we talk about other things like you which know, we plan on doing movies, books, even video games. We're just going to um, bullshit. We should the, just call this Don't Hassle Me, I'm Local, a bullshitting podcast. Eclectic would be better, right? Well, you know <laughs> no, but I If like, I can fit in a curse word, I'm going to throw it in there. <laughs> I just think it would be, uh, I don't know. It's like one of those things where like we named it when it was something else, but then kept it, and it still kind of works, but not really. What's funny Sorry, is I watched that movie recently, and like it's just it brought a smile to my face because when he's walking around with that shirt on, I just... <laughs> I thought of our, I thought of like the two episodes of like oh we did a podcast once <laughs> oh, and it was named after that oh so what what movie were you talking about uh the uh what what about Bob yeah yeah well were you were you just quizzing me there <laughs> yeah well I just we hadn't said what it came from mm. so figured you could you know, I'm sorry for the people at home who are listening the one person at home who's listening. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> it's okay. Your Mom, mom's not listening to this. <laughs> she might. You don't know. Most people are like, you know, they try to behave themselves when their parents are listening, but my parents know that I have a really filthy oh, mouth, so they're the just like... Not the singer of Taking Back Sunday, apparently. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's putting on a show for them. Yeah, to be, to be completely honest... You know what? They do their thing and they do it well, but I'm I'm not a fan. You know they did, uh, they put on a good show when we saw them. When was that? Two weekends. We ago? went and saw them the 14th. That's so, right. Yeah. So 10, 11 days ago. And I feel like drinking them. Lacroix while doing a podcast is a really bad idea. I'm gonna be burping, be burping. <laughs> burping through half of the thing. <laughs> yeah. It was, but no, they were you know again yeah, they good at what they do. You know I yeah it was fun. I'm not a fan, but I'll tell you yeah. what, Coheed when they came on that tone <laughs> that wall of sound and when we you know because we left early and. I I would have needed earplugs if I was any closer. Like I honestly wish I had wore earplugs because my ear, like my right ear, I, I must be developing tinnitus or something because like my ear was fucked up for the next two days. But at I the didn't same have any problems. at the same time, man, worth it. Uh, yeah, dude. But that, we we got down so we were at the lawn, and when we left, I mean, I was seriously like it was just a wall of sound. I mean, when they came out. I mean, you got but not take... wall sound in the bad way. No, 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 no. It was like, awesome. Good. I mean, that tone, like, when they came out, it was like Taking Back Sunday with their very low distortion, um, 
low gain amps, and then all of a sudden, you know, because they share when they were playing one of their songs. I don't know. I'm I'm um, not as big a coheed connoisseur as you. So, but it was like one of their pop punk songs. So they share that pop punk kind of. It was probably Favor House with, Atlantic. Was, I don't know if they had gotten to that one yet. I think I remember looking on the set list. That was one that Hillary knew. It was it was like the second or third song. Okay, I'd have to go through the set list but, that they played. I'll pull it and up. Here. I went to Hillary and I was like, "This is straight up Taken Back Sunday." And she was like, "Thank you for making that connection because but people, better though she's like, people, <laughs> people make fun of like Taken Back Sunday, but Kohi has if there's like a Venn diagram, they have that quality. But and I told her and I said. What Take It Back Sunday doesn't have is the prog metal that Kohe does. Because they can is, mix that pop like. punk with that proggy, I wouldn't even call it metal, because at times it is it has that metallic quality to it, it's, but it, it, it yes. definitely has that hard rock. Like, it doesn't, it's not afraid to get heavy. I would call it. If you were throwing the prog word in, you could, I would say it's, it's metal. Um, yeah, but, no, but, you're, but, but they I don't, agree. They typically don't mix the two, though. They yeah. have like the one song... Two's my favorite one. Or Favorite House Atlantic or The Suffering. Or or they have Gravity's Union. Or The Welcome Homes or the... Yeah, but you know what? It's interesting. There's a couple of songs on um, uh, um, their second album, uh, In Keeping Secrets, that bounce between the two. Like, for me... um, uh, The song that's towards the end of the album, Al the Killer kind of has that quality for me where it has that like nasty raw kind of guitar especially if you hear mm-hmm. it live like the recording version you know you can tell they didn't have much of a budget when they recorded it originally but um live nasty crunchy guitar riff driving the the intro and the verses and then when the chorus kicks in it's straight up just like pop punk type really? of shit but not in like the best way possible because i can't stand pop punk and but at the same time i think that lyrics have a lot to do with that knowing that kohi does stuff from a sci-fi concept perspective makes it so that it comes across less i guess cringy maybe for me but i'm just i'm a sci-fi nerd <laughs> i think you're just rationalizing i don't know maybe like, but like it's, it's again okay. like it makes it so like the pop punk stuff isn't as cringy for me yeah because especially in a song like al the killer he's basically saying you know like when i kill her i'll have her die white girls it's like it's about it's about this dude who's fucking fascinated with killing white women right. in his spaceship you know clearly claudio has some it, or had some issues, <laughs> but uh, you know, again, I I just feel like it kind of comes across a little bit better. Yeah, it's a little more tolerable. I guess I'll use that word. Fair enough. Um, but they don't. But so back to what I was. It was saying, Devil in they, Jersey City that they played. That was very pop punkish. Oh, okay. That was off their first album. That was the one that that you were probably like, "This is but it's straight just taking fu- back something." Yeah, it's funny because like I would not. The only reason. I know anything about Taking Back Sundays because of Fitz. Mm-hmm. And then Hillary likes them too. So I'm going to name drop it. Fitz out here. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Fitz will be the only person listening. <laughs> Especially uh, if we tell him we, not, if we name dropped him. <laughs> you know, we said it too early. Ah. He'll tune, you know, he can tune out the rest of the way. But, um, <laughs> you know, I would never listen to Taking Back Sunday for any, um, any like music elements, you know? So therefore, like the tone obviously is not really uh, what I would what I would prefer. So that's why I'd, I think you know Coheed has to have that high gain, you know, the really good gear. Well, the moment that and, Dark Sentencer kicked in, it was like, all right, these guys are not here to fuck around. And the way that the light show played into it too, where you know the moment that intro started fading out and they went into that main first riff, and then the uh, music drops out. And uh, and then there's like the voiceover thing, and then the whole like chanting stuff comes in, and yeah. the way the keyword symbol lit up, I was like, oh, Sick. holy I, shit! I don't care who you are, whenever you come out on stage with the silhouettes, if you have that flight show, like they, they, <laughs> that automatically just makes you that much more like, badass. They whipped out their dicks that night, and we're just like, here they are. And, Look at this. <laughs> what uh, I've always thought this is cool about, you know, not every band can do this, um, or 
if the silhouettes of bands. You know, there's only so many that if you just see a silhouette of them, you can tell which band they are. And Coheed would be one of them, mainly because of his hair and the way yeah. that he stands. You know what I mean? But you would be able to be like, oh, okay, that's Coheed. And then, like, you know, uh, there's another one, Primus. Yes. Because in the My Name is Mud. And, and Tool, Tool to a certain degree as well. It's all about the show going on behind them as opposed to I feel them. like uh, if I saw Silhouette of Mastodon, I could probably pick it out. You know, any kind of unique hair, beard styles or whatever. Speaking of bands that do the whole silhouette thing or playing in shadow, I remember when I saw um, 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 Death Clock play and how Brandon Small was just in shadow. Everyone was in shadow playing that. And, like, for me, that was the first time I'd actually seen a band that just, like, never actually put any of the members out there. And it was all about, like the cartoon show going on behind them because everything was like perfectly synced and I'm thinking to myself how the fuck did they like get all the click tracks to sync up with the fucking the the, uh, the audio and the visuals going together in a way that is like I mean it was it felt like a symphony type of thing mm-hmm. like it was yeah. really impressive see I heard that and then when I saw them it was all about Brendan Small Really? Yeah, it was not shadowed. Maybe because, I don't know, it was at House of Blues at Myrtle Beach. I was okay. front, front row center, so I was looking right up at him. But uh, it wasn't, I mean, for some things, like uh, Mermaider, they just played the Mermaider video on the screen. And that was it. There was not, it was not Death Clock playing the exact music that Brendan Smalls and his guys were playing. It was just like clips from the show, and then they were playing. When so you saw them, who did they play with? Mastodon. It was a co-headliner. Oh, okay. I, I saw them with, um, what, do you know what year that was? 2009 or 10. It must have been. It was, no. it was crack, the Crack the Sky Tour. It was the second time I saw Mastodon for the Crack the Was Sky. that when That's Death when Clock got... released the third album that they had? I don't even know if they had done... No, second. no. It was I, the second album? I'm not even sure if they did had if the Death Album 2 was out because I never listened to 2 or 3. Uh-huh. I just kind of got out of got out of it, but I I knew every song they played. Maybe maybe they played like one new one. When I saw them it was over here at the Fillmore in Charlotte and um they were with <laughs> they were with Suicide Silence and um fucking uh Machine Head. Wow. See, I saw him. It was uh, this was Suicide Silence before Mitch died. Like, it was it was uh, not a good experience. No, not to talk ill about the dead or anything like that, but it was not a good show <laughs> well, on their on their part. As far as Death Clock and Machine Head were concerned, I mean, they were fucking ripped. Uh, High on Fire, Converge, Death Clock Mastodon. Oh, wow. Maybe reverse it. I, I can't remember that's Mastodon. A, that's a good name. fucking bill right there. Yeah, I don't like Converge, though. 2012 was the third album, so I saw them on that tour oh, cycle. Wow. So I saw them, yeah, like maybe even three years before that. So when I saw them, they had full-on production. Like, they didn't leave. Like, they they spared no expense. <laughs> like, when they were introduced, they introduced, like, the band members, like, playing at one point. Mm-hmm. And, br- and he just went up and, like, flexed his arms. Like, I mean, he was He just did do that during the show, like, but then they immediately turned the lights off again, and then the the, the video stuff started playing. And uh, I, just I, I loved it, honestly. Maybe they did have it. Maybe it just wasn't, I don't know. It felt like, for me, like a heavy metal theme park ride. Like, I was just, I was like, I've never seen a band do shit like this before. Nah, it just felt like Brendan Smalls playing Death Clog. But but it was great. I I dug it. Don't get me wrong. It was awesome. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm not complaining. Speaking of Death Clog and Metal Ocalypse, uh, uh, R.I.P. to uh, um, John Schnepp, the director of Metal Ocalypse. He fucking died over the weekend. That shit sucked, man. That guy was awesome. What else did he do? He did um, he did a couple of documentaries um, on top of directing. I believe he directed more television. Um, maybe he did like a couple of features. But the one that stuck out to me that I remember the most was um, the uh, he did a documentary about the Superman film that Warner Brothers was trying to make for years that Tim Burton and Nicolas Cage were making. Like, Nicolas Cage was going to play huh. Superman. Wow. It was called the, the the Death of Superman Lives, I think is what it was called. And he went around and interviewed everybody in the industry that was working on that film at the time because it was the um, producer of the original Batman film with Ma- uh, Michael Keaton mm-hmm. was trying to produce it and get it off the ground. 
And very famously, Kevin Smith was hired to write this particular film. And he does this in his like little stand-up routine where he talks about the producer all the time and how much of a nut job the guy was. And, uh, and Kevin Smith was in this film talking about his experience on that film. Um, Tim Burton was in the film. Uh, he was in the documentary talking about the making of the film. I think Nicolas Cage was the only one that wasn't in the documentary, but mm-hmm. it was really interesting, really cool, and it gives you like a really great insight into just like the way films are developed and how they get into development hell when they're trying to adapt something that big. And thank God it never happened because that it looked like utter shit. Like really? his costume looked like something out of a fucking Halloween store. It was just like it was super plastic looking, like it just looked horrible and his hair he had the 90s Superman hair where it looked like he was wearing like a mullet dude it was fucking hilarious <laughs> but at the same time it was fascinating because I was just like I kind of wanted to see this just yeah. to be like oh my god but at the same time I'm glad that it never happened instead has, has he written any superhero movies? who? Uh, Kevin Smith? no um, he he was a comic book writer for a while he wrote for Marvel he wrote um, Daredevil was his most famous um, series his run on Daredevil which was I believe in the late 90s is really fucking good like really well written nice um, surprisingly so and I like Kevin Smith especially you know Clerks 1 Clerks 2 I fucking love but really anything outside of that is kind of oh, like come on Jane Sonbaum well, I mean, Are you kidding I me? I can't say that it's well written. It's fun, oh but it's God. not well written. But I just I like Kevin Smith just because he seems like a well again. Mallrats was fine too, yeah. but I don't feel like it has the kind of staying power that Clerks wanted Clerks to have. Clerks two, really? Dude, that Clerks two's got some to... funny fucking moments. It in It does, but that's okay. So does Mallrats. So does Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. But I don't feel about like funny moments. The writing? Are you serious? I don't feel like Clerks, I can go. I can give and... you Clerks because that is like they take the most boring job ever and turn it into a movie and it doesn't feel boring ever yeah but the thing is is like I can't go around quoting shit from those other movies the way I can like with Clerks 2 like the shit with Lord of the Rings like I can instantly like I can quote that and someone will instantly get what I'm talking about are you kidding me it's funny as fuck 15 bucks little man that's the most quotable <laughs> okay all right, I'll give you that. <laughs> I will give you that I will anytime give you that. somebody says 15 bucks 15 somebody bucks, little man is gonna sing put that shit the song. in my hand <laughs> all right I'll give you that Thank one you. I'll give you that one doesn't have anything on berserker you're right I- <laughs> doesn't have anything on berserker <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Olaf man what happened to that guy's career man god, I would love to listen to that band we need to find that guy see if he's still living man and um, get him to do a fucking yeah, tribute yeah you're right Every t- if I try to quote Mall Rats no- nobody ever gets it if yeah I, if I'm I, at the mall and I see an escalator and again the kid <laughs> is back on the escalator <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and for me also so Clerks th- too though. There's the scene where they do the King Diamond references. Like that shit is so funny to me. <laughs> Let me help you out of your chair, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I love uh, it. But I think, and I guess just my my personal opinion that the only ones that don't really fit are when he went all sentimental and they're, they're fine in their own way I guess but I don't like really care chasing for Amy and shit yeah. like that Jersey Girl like no one really wants to, yeah. you know I guess whatever but and, like Zach and Mary too is where it was like this is just <laughs> not good but like Dogma Mallrats Clerks 1, 2 Jay and Silent Bob I mean they Pretty all much anything that really included Jay like, and Silent Bob like in a meaningful manner kind of you know had some sort of stain there. See, I started with Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. So okay. I missed so much of the inside jokes. And then it wasn't until I was, you know, I watched that movie. I got it on DVD uh, back, you know, when you would go to Best Buy and buy a DVD. And uh, I mean, I could quote the whole thing. And Baker always liked it. So uh, oddly enough, in college we would do it, you know, we would, we would quote it. And then finally, this guy, Josh that I was uh, kind of in a band with up in Boone uh, brought over Clerks 1 and 2 and he like left them so I still have them <laughs> so, oh, <really? laughs> so, one so, of those deals yeah so I actually you know I got in I, I, uh, my first I experience with Mallrats, Clerks so. was um, I was taking a, a 
film class in this was like right before I went into college and I was taking like a it was like a theory on a film class and one of the films that was listed on there was Clerks and I was also reading a book that was talking about um, independent films and uh, you know independent films that had like a, um, a big impact in the industry and Clerks was on that list so I went I went to my library of all places I went to the library and I borrowed it at the fucking library and I remember watching it and they had the scene with the whole 37 37 dicks I'm like this isn't the fucking library holy shit <laughs> There's, like, some sort of cultural uh, relevance to this movie, I guess, but I was, like, I didn't know what to expect. Like, I, at first, when I first watched it, I didn't really like it because I didn't get it. <laughs> I know. And then afterwards, I, it let it marinate a bit. I was like, oh, it's just a movie about a bunch of guys fucking around yeah. and their shitty-ass jobs. And I'm that's 37. when I grew to love it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm 37. <laughs> 37. My girlfriend sucked 37 dicks. In, in a, a row? row? <laughs> Try to, Try to suck any <laughs> dick on the way to the parking lot. Hey, hey, hey get hey. back here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, um, yeah. But, yeah, if, if you ever get the chance, if you ever have the opportunity, uh, check out his Daredevil run because it's really good. Like, a lot of what they um, took from the um, – a lot of what they translated into the, um, the Netflix series has echoes of his line or his um, – particular run on daredevil mixed with like what frank miller did but uh his stuff's pretty good surprisingly um but yeah it's funny we happened to just jump into a tangent on kevin smith films I yeah i like that one thing I but like uh kevin smith, though. so yeah, kevin smith is to my see, podcasting idol <laughs> glad to see he, uh, he survived the widow you know oh yeah the widow maker time. yeah the widow maker God, so man, dude, he's like dropping scary. weight too have you seen him yeah man i so. follow him on instagram so he yeah Same. yeah and i watch his podcast i subscribe to his podcast i'm on i'm listening to that shit all the time so good on him man good on him fitz would try to get me into that the fat man on batman ones oh dude i love them i just love them they're, they're like yeah, them I don't have any new ones those to and uh, i'm really into double toasted is a movie podcast but they also do kind of like tomfoolery bullshitting kind of podcasts in between the movie stuff that are really big they're really cool guys I'm besides my sports ones that I listen to and <clears throat> the rich roll one I was telling you about that uh, you ever listen to Mark Marins the guy that does glow the no glow? man he like glow like the like um, the Netflix yeah I, so he's the you know he's the like the dude with the mustache and the glasses oh really he's done he's called it WTF mm-hmm. and um, you know when it's podcasts with guests you can really judge the merit of a podcast by the quality of guests and they are just like a plus celebrities i mean i don't know how he gets these people i don't know i don't really know much about what he's done aside from i think he had a, a show it was an ifc thing on netflix called marin but um Dude, he gets everybody. I just listened to one Billy Bob Thornton the other day. He had Paul Rudd on there for the Ant Man stuff. Oh, uh, wow. He did one. I mean, you go back for years. I mean, there's. I'm just picking them out. I mean, he did uh, Jeff Bridges. He did one with Marilyn Manson right before he like got hurt. Wow. Uh, on stage. Holy so shit. I mean, it's just like everybody. They just there's just like no agenda really. They're just talking. And, Freeform talking. Yeah, and so uh, I really I really, I listen to that one when it's somebody I know. I don't I don't listen to. Don't listen to all the ones, but the and Billy Bob Thornton moment's really, really another good. good one. That's it's kind of a podcast, kind of not. <clears throat> it's like a they're kind of like video um, interview type of deals uh, called Hot Ones on YouTube. Look them up; they're pretty cool. It's uh, this guy talking to various guests, whether they be. I mean, he's got everyone from like I think he had he had like Dwayne Wade on one. He had nice. fucking uh, Chance the Rapper on another, I believe. Um, uh, he's had actors on there like uh, Terry Crews and you know Kevin Hart. I'd like Hart. to the Chance the Rapper one for sure. So like basically, what <laughs> they're eating hot wings while they're doing an interview, and the hot wings start from like they start like really low as far as their intensity level, and they slowly get to the point where like they would kill a normal person, <laughs> and he makes these people eat them while he's asking them questions. They're all like twenty minutes long. So That's like awesome. It's what's it called? It's called Hot Ones. Oh, it's man. huge on YouTube. It's got a shitload of viewers. It's got a shitload of uh, subscribers. Look it up. It's yeah, really good shit. Check that out. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, good shit. I'm, I'm pretty sure Chance Rappers on. I could be wrong. I feel like that's like a, you'd have to a way more intense version of Jerry Seinfeld's 
the uh, the getting, getting coffee, co- coffee in cars. <laughs> yeah, like this. It really make you eat some hot ass like, wings and get the truth out of you, man. It's like the sadistic <laughs> version of it's like if Jigsaw from the Saw movies did an <laughs> interview show. Jesus. Um, so yeah, great, that, that's that's a good one to watch. It's, it's I would it's love it. Let's do. We should do that. I should rip them Dude, off. Dude, do it once. I can't even. I cannot do that. Oh, I got yeah. terrible acid reflux. Yeah, I'd I die. <laughs> Well, maybe I could also say, I could write audience. all the questions for you and you could do all the you work. interview me and I'll eat hot yeah, ones. <laughs> we'll find the hottest ones in Charlotte. <laughs> hey, as long as it doesn't have the ghost pepper in it, man, I'll do some of these habanero. Do. I'll I can go up to that, but once you start doing the ghost pepper, that's uh, no bueno. No, this is. But I can I can I can do some hot wings, man. I went to Buffalo at the Anchor Bar mm-hmm. where they you know originated the buffalo wing, and I had the hottest ones there. To be fair, they really weren't that hot, but. You know? I'm such a puss when it comes to that shit. I can't do it. Like I just, I will instantly regret it. We, um, <clears throat> in college, we worked at Beef O'Brady's. It was this very low key but franchise family sports bar, and uh, they had a nuclear sauce. And Fitz ended up working there with me too towards the end. And uh, we would always see who could eat the most uh, oh nuclear God. rings. And then they added a new ingredient. They added the ghost pepper to them, and it was like once they did that. We stopped doing it. <laughs> One of the hotter ones in this show is called Megadeth. Megadeth sauce. Nice. And it, yeah. And then there's like Mad Dog 57. <laughs> and it's some crazy shit. The, the one that they, they actually got popular enough that they made their own sauce. So like now the very huh. hottest sauce that they have is their own that they make. It's called The Last Dab. And you're supposed to put like a little dab on yeah. like the end of the wing and it will like... My brother. The coolest one is um, with Neil deGrasse Tyson. He was on the show. Oh, that nice! Was fucking cool. So my brother is all about hot sauce, right? Oh yeah. So there's like the ghost pepper, which I always thought was the hottest one, and then you got the scorpion pepper. So my brother's like just I putting never scorp- heard of that He's putting shit. like scorpion pepper sauce on all of his stuff, even, and then he gets his own like Carolina Reaper stuff. Oh, which is you know. Genetically modified pepper, you know, it's not even na- it's not even natural. Get a little bit of GMO in your your they, hot sauce. Uh, <laughs> they uh, make a chip now. There's this chip company. I can't remember what it is. They sell them at Harris Teeter the habanero ones that are actually really hot. Or no, no, it is a ghost pepper one that's really hot. But apparently, they'll send you one chip that was made with the ghost pepper, and it's called like the one chip challenge. Oh, God. And celebrities were doing it and stuff like Carolina Panthers, like Greg Olson was doing it. And it's like you have to eat the chip and like sit without any milk for like a certain amount of time. And no thanks. Of course, like bar, <laughs> of course, like barstool sports on Instagram shows like these like sorority girls doing it. Oh and my just, god! Like, crying, like dying in the mall. Mo- like I mean, that fucking page is funny as hell. It is. It like, used to be sports. It's a little it really too did. fratty for me at times. Yeah. But there are a handful that I'm just like. I laugh so hard when I see them, like like the ones you're talking about, like where the the girls will go and do that shit. It's uh, chicks in the wild, I think, is where they. It's get like the, it's uh, almost like from. yeah, it's like the Instagram equivalent of like whitegirlwasted.com <laughs> yeah. or some shit like that. But I th- I feel like the <laughs> when they do go fratty, they're totally making fun of it. At least in my opinion. I don't know, like some. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like how Kook Slam is. Yeah, I mean, it's like Kook Slam gets pretty fucking funny too, where it never we, falls into. F- like bro-ish kind no, of humor for it's me. It's just people in, around water falling Doing or boogie dumb boards. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite is when they're on the rocks. Oh like, taking God. a picture and it just you know it's gonna be a bad time. These people are just filming it, man. I can't. Yeah, the ones where it's like they're on like the cliffside or whatever of like, and a wave's about to come knock their ass off. I can't watch those. That's the like, one. Yeah, and those those like terrify of me. Of course, I'm at the beach now and like my stepdad is like, oh <laughs> man, I got knocked into the surf and my bathing suit came down. And <laughs> I just laid in the water and you know didn't know what to do and I'm like, someone's <laughs> probably filming you. It's gonna be a cook. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. So what have you been listening to lately? I mean, I know like before we started recording, you were saying Leprous was really on your like. Well, being that we originated as a music podcast, you know, I figure we can kind of jump into talking about some music that we've been yeah blasting lately. Well, so I feel like I've got like two things. I guess something that I like just as much as uh, like what albums do you like this year, or like what bands have you gotten into this year 
that you weren't into last year that may not have a new album out? Because I feel like whenever you're just talking about new albums, it's just a lot of times it's like the same old bands, which is great. Um, but just kind of sometimes I like talking about new artists that I started listening to this year. But um, we'll get to that later. Um, but as far as albums, yeah, I was just looking through um, um, the BT Bam one. Automata. I know when one came out, you know, lackluster. <laughs> think, wait, just, you know, um, we were both in agreement with that. Yeah, I think I think we were like one of the few that were saying that though, because a lot of people were going around at least on like these publications. They were going around saying, "Oh, it is fantastic. They're going in new territory and yada yada yada." I really well, didn't feel that. So, I mean, let me just. Say, I love this band. Like, I love them. I don't love them as much as you do, but I really admire them, especially for their musicianship, and I wasn't feeling it on that first part. Everything they've done, I love the direction, you know, and so, of course, I feel like... Did you think it was a heritage type of deal where you just didn't get it? (laughs) Like, but I got it, but I don't know if it's because I just know, like, so much about it. You know, I always just try to read all the interviews. I follow them all on Instagram, so it's like... All right, they signed to Sumerian Records, which is you know still independent, but it's not, a, you know, it's pretty. It's a big. It's like the biggest metal label now. I mean, that can be the that label too has in is, some areas been the kiss of death for some bands, yeah. just transitioning them too far into the metalcore deathcore. Exactly, shit. and I mean you can look and see who they're on tour with. But I was just wondering if like who are they on tour with? I don't remember. No. Is that like Veil of Myra or Maya or something? Osiris, I think. Oh, okay. It's just, I don't know. It's the Summer Slaughter. Um, oh, okay. So gotcha. I just felt like they continued to do what they do, um, but they just like went real safe with it kind of all around. I felt like um, one thing I like about BT Bam is that, you know, you can get lost in their songs, so it's like... You know, you're listening to it, and then it can be very heavy, and then all of a sudden it's ambient, and it kind of just, like, drones on for a little bit, and then, you know, you're back to crazy time signature stuff. And I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know if it was because, like, I'm so short. Um, but then their EP, I, I found that I was... We're calling uh, it an EP? Because I guess no, it's no, no, technically no. long enough Well, to I was be, going uh, back to, um, oh sorry, Parallax 1. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had three tracks, but you could get lost in that oh, thing. Oh, I for, love you know? that. And so I love that EP I just felt so like much. it, um, I was just, I don't know, it felt pretty ordinary. And and ordinary by BT Bam terms is still like better than most of the shit. But um, it, I just didn't think it was up to their, you know, like taking coma and like, not necessarily like building on top of it, but even like progressing just naturally somewhere. Like I feel like, you know, if you can't, top it like you got to go in a different direction and i don't feel like that they went in like bt bam unknown territory i felt like they kind of went into just kind of like took their sound and made it a little more generic it felt like b-sides to me mm-hmm. but they totally redeemed, redeemed themselves <laughs> for, uh, for automata too um and and i put them both in a playlist which that's i gotta say that's pretty that's kind of aggravating the two releases so I don't know if that was like a press thing I don't know if that was something they were encouraged to do or if that was something that they wanted to do to have like hype for you know two albums but I've had I thought that they were still on their old label I would have assumed that was a play to get them off of the label so they could go independent but the fact that they jumped on Sumerian like that I guess merch I don't know (laughs) pre-orders vinyl colored vinyl you know possibly but anyways I'm glad that you know when two came out, I put it on, and you know, I, I I always, me and Baker talk about it. Give it the three spins. It does, you know, everything you're gonna listen to. If you you know, you got to listen to it three times. And there's several albums that I hated the first time I listened to them. Afterman, even Descent, Dis- Dissension, Dissension. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even like it that much, but I, I listened to it the second time. Okay, it's grown on me the third time. You know, I liked it a lot. So that was actually with that album, I, I started giving everything three times. and That was me with Safety Fire. <laughs> oh, yeah, you used to hate Safety Fire. It gave me, I had, to, <laughs> I had to do, I had to do like 10 listens. And I'm not even talking one album. I had to go through and listen to 
mm-hmm. first and second album like on repeat to kind of really get my head around it because I was like, this is too far into like the metal core ish type of shit for me. I don't like this. Like I instantly jumped to that conclusion, thinking ah, his voice is too whiny. Uh, he sounds kind of like you know how those you know those metal core or death core singers will sound when they're doing like the harsh shit and then they go straight into the really clean shit and it's just kind of like wimpy and whiny. And then I realized when I was, you know, I listened to it, like, I think it was on Listen 5, I finally realized, hold on a minute, this this is not coming across with the intention that a lot of those other bands do, where it comes across very kind of artificial and just kind of phony, mm-hmm. like they're phoning it in, trying very hard to be hardcore and then being sensitive and shit I, ne- I when I really started to be introspective about what they were singing about the way things that w- um, were organized and uh, arranged on each song I started going alright wait a minute this is getting a little further into the proggy type of shit less so I mean it has a little bit of the metalcore ish kind of influences and kind of the gent kind of influences but definitely has more so the prog element that I love in bands like Coheed, and Coheed at times has some very kind of whiny-ish, pop-punk-inspired type of songs, and I'm like, well, if this doesn't bother me, why is this bothering me? I need to wrap my head around this. This is probably an issue from my end, not so much the band's end. I had to kind of recalibrate the way I was perceiving it. You give that quite a quite a chance. I did, because I was like, there's something here. There's something here, especially um, Beware the Leopard. Oh, my God, that song's good. Yeah. I, my favorite is uh, the last track. Glass, is it Glass Crush? Is that what's called? Glass, I have uh, to look it up. I don't know. The last one on Mouth of Swords is by far. I love that one favorite. that's like very soft and quiet, and then, he's like, then it goes into like heavy as fuck. It's like, oh, yeah, becoming um, I am destro- Yeah, I am Destroyer. Destroyer of Wow. And then it just stops. And I am. Yeah, yeah that's just um, badass. All right, so speaking of Safety Fire, Good Tiger came out with a new album, right? Was that this year or last year? That was this year, yeah. This year. Yeah, was this right, year. I've man. listened, man. It I did give kinda, it three, I'm pretty sure. Kinda, Maybe not all at once. It, it was but. really kind of boring. Yeah. I will t- give them credit that they definitely seemed like they started working within their limitations instead of just trying to make everything sound super fucking, like, bombastic the way that they but, were, vocally especially. But the thing is, right, so I think, like, with, the, with an earworm, like, three times, if I don't get something from your album after listening to it, then I just, I don't think it ever makes it back in my rotation. You know what I mean? Like even yeah. going back and listening to old albums. So after that Coheed show, I went back and listened and I'm sitting there singing Man Your Battle Station. You know, like just like that. So I think even with metal stuff, like some kind of melody or some hook's got to get stuck with me and that uh, We Will All Be Gone. Is that what it's called? I can't remember. I just, that, it's, that just very, it's just not very <laughs> memorable, but... Well, so I, like I said, I respect the fact that they started pulling back a little more because you could tell, is it Elliot? Is that their singer? Elliot he he couldn't pull that shit off live at times. Like, it sounded really like he was struggling, and it was kind of painful to hear because, like, I could hear him tearing his voice up. And oh, I was just was like, like, Ugh, like, I liked the songs from a recorded, like, the the actual recorded versions. I think there's issues yes. with the production on them. Um, being a little too artificial at times, but um, overall, I still like those songs, especially yeah, those first hooky. three. They were good. Um, but like you, I think it's funny we brought we brought this podcast all the way back around to Good Tiger because I think the very first, the first one we talked about Good Tiger. It's very front guitar. loaded. It's very front loaded, but right, Safety so. Fire is not. But anyway, we were Next. talking about BT Bam, and we were talking about um, Automata Two. What's yeah. right now? Uh, do you feel like it's c- more cohesive in a manner where you'll just go and listen to the whole thing, or is there one song in particular that sticks out to you more than the others? Yeah, no, I'll listen to the whole thing, and I'll even I'm trying to pair it with one because I feel like two makes one just that much better, just because it's kind of building up to, you know, I'm waiting for the proverbial below. To, See, for you know, me, to listening to the two back to back, it's like watching, um. It's like watching Rogue One, a Star Wars story. The beginning is just like you're trudging through the fucking thing. You're just like, God damn, just get to the end. The last 45 minutes is fucking incredible. Yeah, fair enough. And that's kind of what I, I always just wait for the last half to, to kick in. Mm-hmm. So I feel like eh, just it, 
It really just works better yeah, on its own. Just start it right there, but uh, Voice of Trespass. Yes. <laughs> I was just going to say, Voice of, of Trespass course. is the best one in my opinion. Yeah. And then when it just stops and goes to that chug. Oh, dun, 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 dun. oh man. I, I love what they did with that song. The swing feel to it. It's so and, um, so jazzy. But uh, the leads on that album, are they don't sound forced. Dusty's got some good ones. So I think on the end of Proverbial Below, he's got a nice, nice bluesy one that might be my favorite on the whole uh, record, Automata 1 and 2, which is funny because I was talking to Baker about it. Uh, our favorite solo on Coma is one of his Dusty's on... Uh, Oh shit. <laughs> What's the track called? I don't know. Um, There's a lot of leads on this song. I know, but it's the one... Um, I'll come back to you. You know what? We'll just look it up. I was going to say, but, we um, have the power of the internet we at our do. tips. But um, another album, I think, that um, I don't listen to a lot, but when I do, I really enjoy it, is the new Tesseract album. Yes, I would very much agree with you on that. Option Oblivion, that's the one. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, so I'm um, when I was actually leaving the Ghost Show, which we'll get to that album, I'm sure. Yes, <laughs> I'm uh, sure I, we I will. In, I put in Sonder, and I was just like, I'm going to hit Smile. Oh my God, like the whole album's just worth it, in my opinion, like when he just screams that chorus. So, um, I'm... I don't know really what they did different, but it makes that album, you know, if you listen to, uh, Polaris, yeah, Polaris, you know, it's kind of like, where are they going to go? I mean, they've got a atmospheric gent sound. It's progressive, but I mean, where are they going to, where are they going to take it? But I don't know what they did with Sonder, but I really, really yeah, it's weird because like they didn't deviate from far from what they've done in the past i feel like they just really refined it on this album um i really like polaris i don't think i liked it as much as you and neil did um i know there's a couple of songs on there um what was one of them was it called like phoenix or something like that mm -hmm. that's a really good song i did like that one um it has a very kind of like uplifting triumphant feel to it which is interesting yeah. for a metal track um but uh, for me, Sonder, Sonder brought all the elements that that album had and Altered State had into one cohesive package for me. Um, it had the atmospheric quality that both of those albums had, more so the, uh, the, the stuff that Altered State was bringing to the table, um, which I... God, that's a great album. I love that album so much, it, and... I'm glad that their vocalist now, who was um, in the band um, before that album was released, can pull off those songs the way he does. He does pull them off very well live, uh, more so than the vocalist who recorded those original tracks. Couldn't do it. He couldn't do it, which is, you know, again, yeah, not, nothing against the guy. He just, you know, had trouble doing that stuff live, but... Uh, that album is just so good, and I feel like Sonder was able to kind of meld the two in a way that resonated with me very well. I mean, I love King. King sounds awesome. Luminary, the first song, is really good. But Smile, for me, which is funny because they had released Smile as a single way before releasing this album, and the single version I did not like because it didn't have that whole screaming part of the whole, I can feel you getting yes. closer. And then that whole like high, like high, uh, higher register, almost falsetto-y thing he's doing before it gets into that scream. Like It didn't have any of that stuff. To my recollection, I'm trying to remember, and it voice. just the production on it was very flat. And I remember listening to it with Neil when I was recording vocals for our album. Or right, I'll take that back. I was recording demo vocals <laughs> for the demos way back, um, way back when. And um, we both had the same reaction. We were like, "This is just really flat. There's just not enough oomph to this." Mm -hmm. So I was glad to hear that when it came around on the album, that it really soared the way it could. And I don't know what it is they're doing during that one breakdown section. Um, 
with the whole like down down da, 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 oh, da, yeah. da, down 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 like I don't know what they're doing instrumentally there like what kind of instruments they're using but it sounds like it kind of has like it sounds like bass guitar and almost like keyboard or something yeah and it that extra whatever it is makes that part just like hit you so hard and I agree. It just grooves so so nicely they, yeah they they come up with some tasty tasty grooves um, with those extended range and then the <clears throat> they always got the slap bass on it too kind of mimicking that yeah they've really got their own sound I like it yeah alright what about Ghost Ghost has still listen to that um you know what I recently um when was it I think it was over the weekend I was listening to it and I still like I really like the album but for me, it doesn't resonate with me the way that some of their older songs do. And I, it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird album because, like, for the most part, through, like, the first half of it, I really enjoy it. And then I really like the, um, what's the song with the, While you sleep and earthly the lies of witch image? Is that what it's yeah. called? Okay. Um, I really like that song. Just because it's silly and catchy, the way that a good ghost song should be. Um, but I feel like that album just it ends on a very flat note for me. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I find myself not listening to the last track. The last track and even the last instrumental, which I can't pronounce to save my life. Oh, man, I love it. I, I'm not a fan of that one because Miasma is just so strong but that's all the, the way that's throughout. That's the one that reminds me of old, I'm in a fucking castle in flames with the coos- you know, like... Right. In flames if they were using a saxophone. Uh, no, no, no. I'm talking about the other one, the one that you don't Oh, the like. other one you're talking about. Yeah, uh, See, I, I, don't, I don't hear that That one, Miasma is straight up plugged in in flames, but the, the other one are, are there, you know, they have a lot of softer instrumentals. Um, yeah, I, I, for some reason it just I, what I think would I think it would work better on the album listening wise if the two had been kind of like flipped if it had ended on a higher note than it does because it just ends very flat for me and yeah. uh, I I still really like the album I mean I love that band you know I know a lot of people either love them or hate them but I happen to be. I'm so glad that you them. love them because I love them even more because there's someone else that loves them as much as I do. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, man. Like, uh, there's so many people that are so weird about them where they're just like, if you mention it, they'll be like, "Fuck that band. That band's fucking man. I would smack fake ass would metal just, bullshit." And I'm like, it's clearly you take yourself way too fucking seriously, and that's why you don't get it. <laughs> yeah. But um, but no, I've been enjoying that album. Um, if we're sticking on the topic of occult, satanic inspired uh, music, for me, the Zealand album Arter. I have been blasting nonstop is Zeal and Arter's "Stranger Fruit," and I love that album so much. Uh, what's interesting for me is that I have been listening to that EP nonstop, which I really enjoyed um, most of the tracks on it. Some of the instrumental tracks I didn't really care for, but um, like Blood in the River is just so badass, but the production just really sucked on that EP. It's yeah. just not good. No. And Blood in the River. So <laughs> I had been listening. It is. It is. It is. Um, and I had been listening to a good majority of the songs that are on this album through live videos that people had been recording at their shows. Oh, nice. Because when they went out on tour overseas and then i think they did a handful of shows over here originally they uh they had all the stuff from that ep which i mean they i guess you could call it an album but i'll call it an ep because it just doesn't feel like an album to me they took all the songs from there they were playing them live and then they also had other songs that weren't recorded yet and a lot of these songs that were they were playing live made it onto this album so like for instance, um, the third song on the album, uh, Servants, I had heard the um, live version of it on YouTube with like someone sh- filming it through a shitty fucking iPhone. And, um, and then uh, there's Ship on Fire, Row, Row, and um, We Can't Be Found. Like all those songs I had heard, lo-fi, shitty versions of them. So for me, I was 
waiting and hoping that I was like, please let these make it onto this album. Like, I want to hear how these really are supposed to sound because I like what I hear so far. And when they got put onto the album and then they were really brought out in the way that they should have originally been brought out, it just, it made me super happy because I felt like I had been journeying with this band and I got to finally see them put out something that really showcased all of their best qualities. And, um, cause again, for me, that song servants, don't you dare, um, ship on fire. Uh, we can't be found. And even the title track, stranger fruit, just, they're awesome to me and just at times very unsettling, very interesting. Um, especially with, you know, the, the concept of taking, you know, black metal or doom metal, you know, anything that has that kind of like, um, um, the really super dark quality to it, mixing it with like slave spirituals is just like so interesting to me. Like I just, I can't say I ever would have thought of combining those two. I know. And then the album name, I mean, are there any ties to, to strange fruit? Yeah. Yes. It is. It is inspired by that. I mean, I figured, which again, when you think of the context of all the songs, a lot of the songs, I mean, conceptually, well, and conceptually, the whole idea of the band was like, well, what if, you know, African-American slaves reacted the way that the Norwegians reacted when Christianity was imposed upon them in manners of like burning churches and revolting by going, following Satan and all that other shit. And that whole like, what if scenario just was really interesting to me. I was like, yeah, that that does kind of sound cool. It's like a whole weird you know, like how Django Unchained is kind of that weird what if kind of movie that you just want to see, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it gives you that sense of vindication and empowerment, even if it's utilizing um, dark forces. Um, I just, I love it. I, I really do like that album a lot. Um, I know that you were, when we had talked last about it, you were kind of. I was probably still on like. On the fence. The one, with it. The one listen, so I, I owe it a couple more. Okay. So. Another um, another one for me that I've been listening to, and this is like completely out of the realm of like metal and everything, and this has really kind of been inspiring me with some of the solo stuff that I've been writing lately. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Glitch Mob, which they are um, a group of guys out in uh, California that do electronic music, and it's very ambient, atmospheric electronic music that... I don't know, man. It just puts you kind of in a chill mindset, but at the same time has a lot of like oomph and crunch to it the way that, you know, for me, some metal songs have. Mm -hmm. It's got like attitude at times, but it also just kind of, I don't know, it makes you feel like you're suspended when you're listening to it. Like I really dig it. I can kind of just get lost in it. Listen to it a lot when I'm at work lately. Are they on Spotify? They are on Spotify Mm -hmm. and they just released their new album. Um, which I am trying to remember what the album is. It, the new album is called See Without Eyes, and I really like it. It's a, it's a really good album. It's um, at times goes into like very poppy kind of territory, and um, and uh, definitely sounds a little more mainstream than some of the other stuff they've done in the past. But I really like it. I still think it's really good. Um, I will say, though, that I think so far for me, my favorite release of theirs is still their 2014 release, um, Love, Death, uh, Immortality. That album is just fucking awesome all the way through. Like, it's the best, like, music to listen to while you're playing video games. Like, it's just really good. So, yeah. <clears throat> listening to that shit lately. And then at the same time, I've been listening to, you know, soundtrack stuff like... Um, Really, for me, and this will kind of tie into what we're talking about later if we talk about video game stuff, um, I, I, I've i been, you know, listening to um, the God of War um, score lately, which I absolutely adore, so. But, um, yeah, so, I don't know, I think this might be a good point to do, like, kind of like a, I don't know, kind of like take a quick take a break or whatever. Maybe we'll break this into like two parts or something and, you know, continue conversation, talk about like video game stuff, some movie stuff. I would love, you know what I would love even more if we had, uh, 
Kick your ass in Guitar Hero another time. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no, yeah. uh, there, there's no challenge for you on that because I'm not fucking good. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be a good segue into the video game stuff. I definitely got a lot to say. Cool. Well, uh, I guess that means uh, we'll kind of end part one here and go into part two uh, shortly after. Not to follow in BT Bam's footsteps. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully part two. Maybe part Hopefully two. part one is as good as part two. We'll see. Uh, yeah, maybe we should. Part two will, will be better. Most people are probably just like, <laughs> get to the good shit right now. You guys are just rambling about fucking elitist bullshit. Just come on. Let's talk about some video games and fun shit. So, and uh, yeah, that's a good... No, that's a good uh...